You may be seated at this time, and we want to welcome you to New Life today. We're so glad that you're joining us, and we trust this service will be a blessing to you. And uh, today we've got something very exciting that we are going to uh, observe today, and that is the ordinance of baptism. And uh, But let's have a word of prayer, and we'll get started. Dear Gracious and Heavenly Father, we come before you today. We thank you for the opportunity to worship you, to gather together in person, Lord, for those who are joining us online. Lord, we thank you for these venues to come together uh, as a body of believers, Lord, and look to you. Lord, we pray that you be glorified in our worship. Lord, speak to us through your word. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we want to welcome you to New Life, and we're so glad that you're joining us today. And today we have uh, Louise Bush, and she's going to be joining me here in the baptismal uh, tank at this time. 
And Louise is joined by her husband, Drew, on the front row. Just raise your hand for us, Drew. And uh, they've been, yeah, we can give it up for Drew. And they've, they've been attending for over a year now, and uh, it's been such a joy to get to know them and uh, all, all three of their children, Natalia, Desmond, and Beckett. Uh, Natalia and Desmond were able to go to children's camp this week, and uh, many of your kids went to children's camp as well, which you'll get to see a video of in a few minutes. But Drew and Louise have been uh, led to new life in their journey of faith, and Louise has trusted Christ as her Savior. Uh, she also followed the Lord in believer's baptism. Uh, when she first trusted Christ, it was not by immersion, and uh, through dialogue and through conversation, as the Lord has directed them through to new life, uh, she feels like she'd like to take this step in her spiritual journey, and so we celebrate with her today. And so, Louise, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. Do you believe that Jesus is the eternal Son of the living God, who died on the cross and rose from the dead for your sins? Have you by faith invited Christ into your life as your personal Lord and Savior? Based upon your testimony, we're going to baptize you, our sister, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death. Raised in the likeness of his resurrection. We just like to say for any who uh, may be thinking about the ordinance of baptism for your own life, we'd encourage you if you've never been baptized, talk to one of us, Pastor Mike or myself. We'd love to help you. If you're a teenager, talk to Jake. We want to help you follow the Lord in believers' baptism. We're so glad you're worshiping with us today. Enjoy this video. Uh, of our kids camp this week. Give God the glory, yeah. I invite you to stand. We're going to continue to sing this morning. Yeah, sorry. At this time, excuse me, at this time, children's uh, grades one through six can be dismissed uh, and can go to your class, meet your adult leaders in the back. Thank you very much. All right.
This time, before we have our offertory prayer, Mark and Jackie, I'm going to ask you guys to just come on up and join us for a moment, would you please? Let's give them a nice new life appreciation. I'm going to invite you to stand right here in the center so even the folks watching online can see you. <laughs> Most of you may or may not know that while well, we go back over 35 years, all the way back to LaSalle Street. But of course, I've known Mark and Jackie. You, you guys have served here for so many years. And you were Pastor Michael's Olympian Club leader. You were the children's camp director. And of course, Jackie's been the behind the scenes uh, servant for many, many years as well. Mark and Jackie are moving to Grand Rapids. And so uh, we're going to uh, say goodbye, but not forever. I know you guys will be back around. And what we want to just demonstrate our appreciation for you. Mm -hmm. You know, Philippians 1, verses 3 through 5, says, I thank my God of every remembrance of you for our fellowship in the gospel mm -hmm. from the first day until now. And then 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 18 says that God places the members in the body as he pleases. And then it gives a discourse on spiritual gifts and I think everybody here knows our philosophy of leadership at least my philosophy of leadership I think Pastor Michael embraces it as well I believe in, in pastors casting the vision and then once the vision is cast and the people embrace it you get the right people in the right place for the right purpose and then we just step back and cheer them on mm -hmm. and stay out of the way and that's what we've done with Mark and Jackie for many, many years. And I want to say this, too. It's Mark and Jackie. They're a team. Jackie served on staff for over 20 years. Mm -hmm. And I saw, well, we both saw firsthand the many uh, behind-the-scenes details that Jackie would handle, not only for us, but ministries that passed uh, that mark was uh, i could probably call you pastor mark if we wanted to <laughs> that uh, mark was uh running as well when we came and we brought the olympians to the ministry 30 some years ago we asked mark to lead it they jumped in both feet i think i might have ran a children's camp and i knew that wasn't my ticket you know what i'm saying <laughs> and uh we needed some organizational help and, and mark just stepped in we did the soccer mark ran that and, but all through, and then we went back to the Olympians, Jackie's always been the behind the scenes helping. But Mark, I call you the organizational wizard. Not only are you the organizational wizard, you love the organizational aspect. And I think that's one of the things that radiates from your life. So today we want to give you this plaque of appreciation. It says, in great appreciation of Mark and Jackie Marshall, for over three decades 
of outstanding organizational administration, encouraging fellowship, faithful friendship, mm -hmm. and positive support of the New Life Ministry, presented June 13, 2021 at New Life Church from the pastoral team and the New Life family. And then goes without saying, <laughs> with God all things are possible, Matthew 19, 26. Let's give these folks a great appreciation. <laughs> Love you, buddy. Yeah, I just want to follow up and just say thank you for your many years of service. I have great respect for you both, uh, going back to even childhood, uh, going to through Olympians and the children's camp, and then coming on staff 20 years ago, I, I relied on Jackie so much those early <laughs> years <laughs> of youth ministry when I was going to Moody, and uh, you know, you guys have both in my life been very instrumental and used of the Lord in a powerful way. And I just want to just say thank you and w wish you well. And we know God's going to continue to use you uh, in your next uh, phase of life here. So I just want to say thank you as well. Amen. Let's give it up for him. God yeah. bless you. We love you. Yeah. Have dinner. Thank you earned you very it. much. <laughs> yeah. Love you, man. Yeah. God yeah, we will too. Appreciate you. God bless you. Appreciate you. Well, we're going to have our offertory prayer. And let me say this. Just as 1 Corinthians 12, 18 has said, God places each member in the body as he pleases. There are seasons in ministry. And just as I am handing off the baton to Pastor Michael, and we're not worried about the future for this church at all. Other ministries will be passing on the baton to others as well. And that other might be you. God might be moving on your heart. Maybe God's given you the gift of administration or behind-the-scenes details or certain leadership skills, and you say, you know what? I'm ready to take the next step in my journey of faith. There's not a doubt in my mind God has His people in His place for His purpose to keep the future bright. And all God's people said, let's ask God's blessing. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for your great faithfulness thank you for raising up people like mark and jackie for equipping them and gifting them with their skill set that the holy spirit guided them to serve you and lord i pray your richest blessing as they have an opportunity now to live in grand rapids and be closer to some of their grandchildren and and lord daughter and son-in-law lord just bless them with sweet times together lord we also thank you that we know here at new life that the mission always marches on because it's your mission the great commission may we always be obedient to make disciples of all the nations baptizing them in the name of the father son and holy spirit teaching them to obey all things that you've commanded knowing that, lo, you're with us always, even until the end of the age. Thank you that we saw Louise follow you in believer's baptism today. Lord, we know you're prompting other hearts to make that same step. So, Lord, I pray for the future of new life. We thank you for the past. We celebrate the present. And we anticipate a glorious, bright future. Continue to anoint Pastor Michael and Jake and all the leaders that you are raising up. In Jesus' name. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust Him, how I prove Him o'er and o'er. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh. To trust Him more. Jesus. 
Let's go to the Lord in prayer this morning as we open His Word. Dear gracious and heavenly Father, we come before you today. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to study your Word at this time. Lord, open our hearts. Speak to us in a way that only you can in your power. Lord, I ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, we have began this uh, series on wisdom, and today we're going to take a look at wisdom's worldview and this is uh, the idea is how to have confidence in a complex culture we live in a culture that is more complex than it has probably ever been in history and so when you think about complexity i think about uh nasa i don't know about you guys but you know going into outer space i mean that's not that's not an easy thing and then during the great space race uh there was a lot of competition between the united states and russia and so they were constantly trying uh, to figure out, trying to outdo one another, trying to get there faster, you know, they wanted to, to be the winner in this race. And during that time, the United States of America spent so much time, energy, uh, resources, they spent also tons of money trying to figure out how, if I have one in here, how to get a pen to work in outer space. These are things you just don't think about. Like, how are we going to write in outer space if we, don't, if we can't make a pen that can write in a zero-gravity environment. 
So they spent tons of, I mean, think of all this. Think of all that they, they chose to do. They had to really go to work. And so they finally, eventually, were able to get it done. Do you want to know what the Russians did? They decided to use pencil. <laughs> pencil will write in a zero-gravity space. Pen, you can't, you're going to have to go to work on it. You know, I think about that, and I think about the pencil and the pen, and I think about the great space race. I think that our culture, this complex culture we live in, spends so much time and energy. We're like the United States. We're like that. We're trying to figure out the pen. We're trying to make it right in outer space. We are spending so much time, so much energy, so much of our resources, all in search of truth, in search of wisdom, in search of trying to find how am I going to be able to maneuver through life? Where is the, where is the truth for this situation and that situation and this situation? How can I know what I'm doing is right? And we spend all of this time, I mean, I mean, Think about the, the different articles that you can find online today. I was talking with a gentleman this week. We were talking about the South Bend Tribune. It's just, it's a different, it's a different animal today. These days, you don't read to find news. You just read to see different perspectives on the news. That's what you're reading. You read the South Bend. I wonder what the, what the South Bend Tribune's uh, perspective is on this. You read it for that. We already know the news. We already know. Think of all the different articles that are published. That when it comes to, you know, you've got dietitians that are going to tell you what to eat and how to eat. You've got exercise science telling you what this is the essential stretch you need to do. This is the essential exercise you need to do to be able to live a better life and more quality of life. Uh, you've got people that are health and wellness. You've got the self-help that say, hey, this is how you are successful. This is how you must think. This is how you must maneuver. You've got, you've got doctors telling you what you need to, to eat. And everything sometimes even goes contrary to one another. You've got all the experts telling you their expert opinion. And sometimes they go contrary to one another. And yet, in the midst of all of this wisdom, all of this research, all of this technology, everything that we have available to us, the pencil is like the Word of God. It's like, hello. I still work. I'll work in your marriage. I'll work in your individual life. I'll work as you raise your children. I will work as you involve yourself in the community. The Word of God has never stopped working. We have a choice in life. We have a choice on what world view we will have. Society without God has their worldview. Society with God is called to have this worldview. So we will have a different view of life than the average person that you are in contact with every single day. In fact, I want to show, show you something today. We're talking about uh, worldviews this morning. And when I think about a worldview, there's some things you need to know about worldviews. Okay, let's go ahead and go to that pyramid this morning. So most of the time, what you and I see is the visible. We see the behavior of individuals all around us. But our behavior is directly shaped by the way we see life, our worldview, what we believe about God, what we believe about life, what we believe about one another, what we believe about this world, that is added to our worldview. And then our values are added on top of our beliefs. What is important to us? What, where are we going to put our time? Where will we put our energy and our resources? What will we value in this life? So what we think about life, our beliefs about the foundation of life, and then what we will value and spend our time and resources in, in life, are all invisible. They're all invisible. In terms of in your life, in the lives of people around you, they're all invisible. You can't see those in people's lives. What you see is the effect you see the behavior. And most of the time in life, we get mad at people and we want to like change their behavior. We want to be like, stop doing that. Stop it. Why are you acting this way? Why are you behaving this way? Maybe parents, maybe you felt this way. Maybe you've been like, why is my child doing this? I don't understand. Guess what? They will never change their behavior purely unless they change the way they view life, change their belief about that behavior, and decide to embrace different values on that behavior. You see, your worldview directly shapes everything you do in life. Your behavior is an outflow of what you actually believe is important in life. So what is the view that wisdom has? 
What would be a wise worldview for you and I to obtain in our lives? I would encourage you to turn with me to Proverbs chapter 1 as we begin looking at Proverbs this morning. A wise worldview. Proverbs chapter 1. Would you stand with me out of respect for the reading of God's word? Proverbs chapter 1. We will begin reading in verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel. We talked about this last week, how Solomon got all of his wisdom. The Lord gave it to him. To know wisdom and instruction. To perceive the words of understanding. To receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity. To give prudence to the simple. To the young man, knowledge and discretion. To the wise man, a wise man will hear and increase in learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. To understand a proverb and an enigma, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instruction of your father, and do not forsake the law of your mother, for they will be a graceful ornament on your head and chains about your neck. You may be seated this morning. I want to give you five things that I believe that people with a wise world view do. Are you ready? If you don't do any one of these five things, guess what? Don't panic. You can always start. Because it's not where you begin, it's where you end. So, I want to encourage you, evaluate your life as we talk about these five things that we see in Proverbs chapter 1. Evaluate your life. Say, hmm. You know, I would embrace that. And then as you evaluate them, think about that pyramid. Do my values reflect what I believe? Okay, my values reflect it. Does my behavior show what my values are? That's how you know if you have embraced wisdom's worldview. So I'd encourage you to write it down. Number one, the first thing is wise worldviews see value in gaining wisdom. A wise worldview sees value in gaining wisdom. Solomon states that the intended purpose for Proverbs, he states it right up front in these first few verses. He says, here's what what it is. I want you to gain wisdom and discipline, to understand and have insight, to acquire discipline and a prudent life, to give prudence to the simple. And understanding proverbs and parables. A parable is an earthly, an enigma uh, proverb, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. Those are the five intentions of proverbs. So as you read through proverbs, you'll be like, okay, you know, I'm starting to understand this. And I'm gaining some wisdom. And it's actually making me change my discipline. And it's actually giving me actually uh, a greater insight in life. And a greater insight into situations. A greater insight into this. Man, I, I'm actually, I actually like this. This is really good. I'm, I'm gaining this. But wise people see value in gaining wisdom. They never believe, just like we talked about last week, in humility, they never believe they have arrived. I have all of the answers. You must listen to me. You ever find anybody with all the answers listening to nothing, listen to nothing they have to say? Okay. All of the answers means they probably have none of the answers. Because when you have all of the answers, you've stopped learning. You've stopped gaining wisdom. You've stopped all of that. One of the beauties of Christianity, I believe, this is just a side note, anywhere Christianity has infiltrated a culture, whether it's here or around the world, when they are given the word of God, people in that culture, as they begin to devour the word of God, do you know what they do? Inadvertently, they become continual learners. They don't stop and say, I've learned all I'm going to learn. They continue to learn. And as a result, their society is, be, is made better. Even removing the Christianity element, their society is made better because they are continuing to learn and to gain wisdom. That's what God's word does. It also impacts lives in a very powerful way. A proverb is a short sentence based on a long experience. And if you've ever read Proverbs, you get it. And we're going to read some of those throughout our time in Proverbs. A short sentence with a long experience behind it. And this is important to know because a proverb is a proverb. It's not a promise. 
remember learning that in Bible college. Wait a second, wait a second. I thought Proverbs were promises. If I do this, this will happen. It's not true. Proverbs is about wisdom. Proverbs is about recognizing that you are not the source of all wisdom, that God is. And Proverbs is about applying Proverbs to your life and trusting the Word of God and trusting that it won't return empty and void. However, the proverb is not a promise. So, you can train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. There's no guarantee that if you train up a child in the Word of God, that they will stay with the Word of God. But there is a guarantee that if you don't train up a child in the Word of God, they definitely won't adhere to it. That's what makes a proverb a proverb. We act on faith. There's not a promise behind Proverbs. Proverbs is a source of wisdom. Proverbs is a proverb. So wise people, they actually want wisdom. Wisdom was a very high commodity during this time. I want to share with you some people who are considered wise people in the Bible. Have you ever heard of the man Joseph? Joseph was taken, uh, became a slave in Egypt. Joseph went to prison. Eventually, Joseph was, uh, Joseph was, he, they, the Lord turned over the kingdom of Egypt to Joseph, and God used Joseph to protect Israel as they grew and multiplied under the protection of Egypt at that time until they became slaves of Egypt. Joseph was considered a man of wisdom. Daniel, who went to the lion's den, he was actually on the king's wise council. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, the children learned about him, them this week in children's camp. They were considered wise men in their time. They were on the king's wise council. So the question is, in your life, do you and I, do we value wisdom? Proverbs twelve fifteen says, the way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. What a great picture. We all know foolish people in our lives that are doing something very foolish, and we wish we could stop them, but they have a justification for it, don't they? They believe what they're doing is right. Like, please stop. They're not going to stop because in their minds, they're doing the right thing. The way of a fool is right in his own eyes. Others around him may see differently, but this person can't help but see that they're doing the right thing, they believe. We live in a culture where many are wise in their own eyes. We live in a society that makes decisions based upon desire, and then they back it up with rationalization. I want to do this, so I do this. And then, because I've done this, I'm going to back it up with this rationalization and this research to show that I'm actually okay doing what I want to do. That is the way of the fool, doing what's right in our own eyes, and then trying to justify the decision. Wisdom is worth researching. Searching for wisdom, I'd encourage you to think of it this way. Searching for wisdom, there's, there's a difference between searching for wisdom and justifying action. Searching for wisdom in your life, in a decision you are about to make, searching for wisdom is about approaching the subject in the Word of God without your mind made up. Without your mind made up. Searching for justification is making up your mind and looking for the Word of God to validate what you have to say. There's a big difference. We live in a society that wants to make up their mind and then validate their decision and their behavior. That's not what wisdom is. Wisdom is approaching a subject without your mind made up so that you can seek out wise counsel, so you can seek out the Word of God, so that you can seek out the Lord's face and then apply yourself to that decision and make a wise choice. There are three ways to gain wisdom. When it comes to wisdom, there are three ways. One is through God's word. According to Psalms, a fool has said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt. They've done abominable works. So you can't have wisdom unless you value God's word. You can be intelligent and be foolish. You can be highly intelligent. You can have wonderful degrees from great institutions of the world in society without God, and yet you can still be biblically foolish because wisdom is about valuing God's word and valuing his instruction. So you can gain wisdom through God's word. You can gain wisdom through life experiences. You can go through a life experience, and God can teach you through that life experience. You can say, you know what? 
Next time I go through an experience like this, I'm going to apply what I learned this time, and it's going to make that next time a whole lot easier. That's called the school of hard knocks. Anybody ever been there? Nobody in this auditorium. I guess I'm the only one. Life experiences. And number three, godly counsel. Godly friends. Friends who care about the things of Christ. Friends who also care about the value of God's word and his word impacting your life. If you're seeking out advice from people who do not care about the things of the Lord or care about the word of the Lord, that is not wise counsel. That may be counsel, but that's not wise counsel. So if you want to gain wisdom, if you want to search out wisdom, you value God's word. You value the Lord's work in your life through experiences. And you seek out others around you who you can gain counsel from that have also an equal love for the Lord. So a wise worldview sees value in gaining wisdom. A wise worldview, number two, embraces absolute truth. We have to embrace absolute truth. Wisdom flows from truth. It's the foundation. There has to be truth. There has to be a firm foundation in our lives. There cannot be wisdom without an absolute foundation of truth. There has to be a standard, if you will. The Ten Commandments, for example, that is truth. That is black and white. The Ten Commandments, they're, you know, do not lie. There's no gray there. It's just do not lie. Do not steal. That's black and white. There's no gray in there. You can't grab this for today and give it back tomorrow. The Lord says, don't steal. It's very simple. But the only way that that works is if you believe in absolute truth. God is truth. It is his nature. God is the standard of truth. It all flows from the Lord. We must embrace absolute truth. If we don't embrace absolute truth, we can never have wisdom because in any given situation, anything can always change. What is right today will be wrong tomorrow. What is wrong today will be right tomorrow. It will always change. And God is changeless. So that means God's truth is changeless. It does not change. That means God's standard does not change. There must be absolute truth. Wisdom is lived in the gray of life. I want to share with you a few experiences here. Wisdom is lived in the gray of life. So what do we mean by that? Well, Joseph, who we already talked about, was a wise man. Joseph was taken to Egypt. He was sold into slavery. Then, while Joseph was in Potiphar's house, God used Joseph in a great way. He became second in charge to Potiphar. He, was, he had control over all of Potiphar's things. And while he was there, while Potiphar was away on a business trip, if you will, Potiphar's wife came to Joseph. And she began trying to entice Joseph, trying to woo Joseph. And, and he, would not, he would not have anything to do with it. Was it wrong for Joseph to talk to Potiphar's wife? Was it a gray area? Well, it was a gray area that was going to lead to a black and white sin. Do not commit adultery. That's black and white in Scripture. And what is it that Joseph does? When she grabbed his coat, he ran and left his coat and got out of the house because he knew it was not wise to stay in that house, it would lead to a black and white sin. Wisdom is lived in the gray. A lot of times in life, things don't boil down to a right and wrong decision. Things boil down to a wise and unwise decision. Is it wise for me to do this? Is it wise for me to be here? Is it wise for me to allow this to happen? I think about Daniel. Daniel was being told not to pray. Now, Daniel could have prayed to God in secret. He wouldn't have done anything wrong. But those captives who had been taken captive, Daniel, since he was a teenager, had been opening his doors to the east, to Jerusalem. Do you know why he did that? Daniel opened his doors and he prayed to the east because in those days, God did not dwell in us. God dwelt in the temple. And so the Jews who were scattered all throughout the world and as those who had been taken captive, they would bow down and they would kneel and they would open up their doors to the east and they would pray towards the temple because that's where God's glory was and that's where God's presence was. And Daniel wasn't going to change 
his behavior and his values and his beliefs and his worldview just because a king said, no more praying to anybody but me for 30 days. Now that's a gray area for Daniel, but it would lead him to a black and white sin. Have no other gods before me. Daniel wasn't about to do that. Daniel went and he opened up his windows. He could have prayed in secret, but he said, you know what, Lord, I'm going to trust you in this gray area. I'm going to do the wise thing, and I'm going to keep you first and foremost in my life. We have to believe in absolute truth. If we don't believe in absolute truth, we will eventually cave to every situation around us, and sin will eat us alive from the inside out. It will happen. So wisdom sees value in gaining wisdom, and it embraces absolute truth. Most of our lives, decisions are not going to boil down to, is it right or is it wrong? It's going to boil down. Is it wise or is it unwise? That's why we seek out wisdom. That's why we look for it. That's why we talk to godly friends about it. You know, I got this decision I'm facing. What's your insight on this? We value this. That's a wise worldview. I'd encourage you to write down, fear the Lord. A wise worldview. People fear the Lord. The fear of the Lord is stated 11 times in Proverbs, and simply fear the Lord is stated four times. Why is that? Because all biblical wisdom begins with embracing the truth that there is a God, that we are not that God, that our God is the creator and sustainer of all things, and he has put divine order into place. And if we follow his wisdom, that divine order, and obey it and live it, it will eventually lead to either salvation or it will lead us to destruction. That's why a wise man walks with wise, but a companion of fools will be destroyed, Proverbs says. A wise man walks with wise, but a companion of fools will be destroyed. Ultimately, wisdom leads to salvation. Even not just forget about eternal salvation, just sa saving grace on this face of the earth. Wisdom will save you from terrible things. It will save you from committing awful acts. It will save you from doing the wrong things in life. Foolishness will destroy you. It will tear you apart. It will pull you apart as, uh, at the seams. It will destroy your life. Biblically, when you think about those same, same people, people like Joseph. Let's go back to Joseph for a second. He made this decision to run. He ran. He didn't try to reason with Potiphar's wife. Hold on, hold on a second, hold on a second. He didn't do that. He ran. He got out. Do you know what Joseph says? Joseph had a fear of the Lord. This is what Joseph said in Genesis 39.9. He says, how can I commit this great act of wickedness against Potiphar, his master? No, against my God. Joseph, I want you to think about something. His master was the chief executioner for the country of Egypt. The chief executioner. If there was anybody to be afraid of in Egypt, other than Pharaoh, it was Potiphar. You should be afraid of Potiphar. That was reason enough for Joseph to run. But do you know what Joseph was truly afraid, afraid of? Do you know what Joseph was truly fearful of? He was fearful of committing wickedness against his God. You see, Joseph had the fear of the Lord in his heart. Now, some would say, well, we're not supposed to be afraid of God. We're supposed to respect God. I would argue it's both. Anytime in Scripture that you see things like, well, maybe we should do this and not this, usually it's both and. In fact, the word that is used in the Greek when it comes to the New Testament and in the Hebrew, they have to do with both and. That's how it's described, both and. Do this and this. Do this both and this. Fear has to do with having a holy respect and awe for God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit who resides in us. But it also has to do with true trembling before the face of one who holds our existence in his very hands. The Almighty, the All-Powerful, the Creator of all things, ex nihilo, out of nothing, this God. We should fear that Lord. We should make decisions not because of our fear of our employer or fear of our 
uh, spouse or fear of our children. A lot of people make all those decisions. Oh, I don't want my employer to be upset at me, so I'm going to make this decision. I don't want my spouse to be upset at me, so I'm going to make this decision. I don't want my children to be upset at me. I'm going to make this decision. I don't want my friends to be upset at me. I'm going to make this decision. My friend, we are making all of our decisions with the wrong fear. If we fear the Lord, we'll make the right decisions. If we fear the Lord, it may not make our employer happy. If we fear the Lord, it may not make our spouse happy at times. If we fear the Lord, it may not make our children happy at times. If we fear the Lord, but we're ultimately seeking to please God and bring glory to his name and trusting him for the results because we're applying wisdom to our lives. So the question I have for you today is, who do you fear? Who do you fear? God wants us to fear the Lord. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. The fear of the Lord. But fools despise wisdom and instruction. I encourage you to write down, number four, apply wisdom, or apply knowledge learned. Apply knowledge learned. So wise worldviews that people embrace, they see value in gaining wisdom. They embrace absolute truth. They fear the Lord, and they apply knowledge learned. We must apply what we learn. If we don't apply what we've learned, it's foolishness. We have this wisdom in our lives, in our minds, in our hearts, we've got this wisdom that God's given us, so we got to do it. It's not adju- enough just to know it. We must act upon it. In fact, wisdom essentially is the application of knowledge. Once you've learned it, you apply it and do it. That is the application of knowledge. You can actually embrace absolute truth. You can fear the Lord. But if you don't act upon that, we are still being foolish. Just a few earthly examples. Let's just imagine for a second it's 5 o'clock and McKinley is just flooded with cars, which happens every day from 5 to 6.30. Probably about 4.30 to 6.30. This road out here, this four-lane highway just is jammed. And you walk out there and you know that the street is flooded with cars and they're going 45, 50 miles an hour down that highway. There's four lanes going. And you know it's dangerous. And you know you should look both ways. And you close your eyes and you say, God will protect me. And you start walking. Is that wise? No. God wants us to apply knowledge that he's given us. He wants us to use it. Starts raining, torrential downpours, just like we had at children's camp. Just pouring down rain. We had a choice as we were driving home in that pouring down rain. Should I turn my windshield wipers on or should I just let the car go? See what happens. Use the wipers. It's the wise thing to do. We had the joy of going to the beach this week with our family. Uh, Friday afternoon, we took the, took the kids up to the beach. It was a lot of fun. Uh, and while we were there, I don't know if you know, it's like 90 degrees. Did you know it was about 90 degrees on Friday? Okay. It's hot. Okay. You know what happens to sand in 90 degrees? Like 17 degree burns on your feet. Like it's terrible. And I'm a croc lover now. So I don't know if you know that about me. All right. So I'm there with our son, Ethan, and I'm I'm walking with him. The girls are, they're, they're in sandals. They're in sandals. And they're just walking on top of the sand so perfectly. And I'm thinking like, me and, my, me and our son, we, we've got Crocs on. We're going to be good. We can just power through the sand. Do you know what happens to Crocs in hot sand, just so you know? Sand pours in the side and it won't come out. It was the hottest thing I've ever done. I was walking on fire on Friday. Ethan's crying, Dad, my feet, my feet. I'm like grabbing him, throwing him on my shoulders. I'm carrying a cooler. I'm walking with Ethan. And I, like the, my, my feet, I thought, I thought they were going to be red and blistered by the time I, we got to the water. It was so bad. In fact, it was so bad when I got home, I texted a friend who's here with us this morning, a fellow crock lover. I said, just so you know, do not wear crocs to the beach. It's a terrible mistake. You must wear sandals so you can stay on top of the hot sand. Now, here's the deal. I gave him the knowledge. Now the choice is up to him to apply the knowledge. You see, we have situations all around us where we're given knowledge People tell us, make sure you do this. Make sure you don't do this. Make sure you do this in life. Make sure. And then it's up to us to decide on if we're going to use it. That is what God has done. God has given us his wisdom. 
In fact, that wonderful wisdom that we studied last week that came to Solomon, that the Lord said, I'm going to give you, you're going to be the most wise person outside of Jesus Christ who will ever walk the face of the earth. None will come before, have come before you this wise. None will come after you this wise. That wisdom, that very same wisdom, the Holy Spirit used the, the King Solomon to write it down. So you and I have portions of this wisdom. We have the wisdom of the living God. And if we will apply it, our lives will be used in an incredible way. It will be used to take us towards the saving grace of God, not towards the destruction of sin. But just like I sent that text to my friend, now the choice is up to him. The choice is up to us. The Lord has given us his word, and now it's your decision. What will you choose to do with it? How will you choose to value it? God desi desires that we apply what we know. And think about this for a second. We live in a time where there have never been this many Bible translations. And yet we're seeking to still get them to, to languages that don't have the Bible. In the English language, we have never had this many Bible translations. We have more commentaries. You can pull up on your smartphone the Bible app, and you can look at commentaries, and you can look at more things than what pastors 50 years ago had in their entire study. We have it here in the palm of our hand. We have all of this. We have great books about the Bible, great books about theology. We have all kinds of wonderful things to know the Lord by. <clears throat> and yet, many would say that right now in America, we are considered one of the most biblically illiterate cultures or societies that have been in our history since our formation. We are responsible for applying wisdom for ourselves. We must see it. We must do it. We must recognize it. I'd encourage you to write down number five. Allow God to make your life attractive to others. A, a godly worldview, a worldview of wisdom. It's, it sees value in gaining wisdom. It embraces absolute truth. It fears the Lord. It applies knowledge learned. And then it allows God to make their life attractive to others. It says in verse 9 that those who heed the instruction of their father and don't forsake the law of their mother, because back then in this culture, biblical wisdom was passed down from one generation to the next generation to the next generation, and it was taught in the homes. In fact, a lot of people don't understand how the, the Old Testament time was. And what happened was is, is the men, ages 13 and above, that's, that's why it was such a big deal to become a man in Jewish culture, the men would report to the temple or report to the tabernacle, depending on where they lived and how close they were to the temple, and they would be taught the word. They would be taught the word of God, and it was made, under, made for them to understand. And then the men would then go home, and they'd sit down with their families. And it wasn't like a family of like four or five like we have today. They, the patriarch of the family, he would gather the family around. I mean, there could be a hundred people gathered around. And that man, he was the pastor. He was the shepherd of his family, and he would teach them. So when it says to heed the instruction of your father, it's basically like saying in the Old Testament times to trust the values that are being passed down from your father and mother. Trust them like you are to a spiritual leader because the father in the home was like the pastor to the home. To trust that, to value that, to heed the instruction of your mother. Man, that is what wisdom is. It's valuing what God has to say for us. And when we do that, it says they will be like a graceful ornament on our head or chains about our neck. It says that we will become more attractive to others around us. Why? Because they'll see the decisions that we're making. They'll see the way we view life. They'll see what we're doing. They'll see the joy that we have, the satisfaction, the fulfillment in our own lives because we're living life according to God's plan, not according to our own. And when you and I apply the wisdom of God to our lives, we will. We will be noticed. Yesterday, we wrapped up a great soccer season with all three of our children. And um, at the end of the soccer year, now when Pastor Mike's your sponsor, he, he got us some trophies yesterday, which were definitely pretty awesome. But the organization, they give these medals out. So we gave the medals out last week, and then yesterday, kids got some trophies. But do you know what happens? Now, all kids, I, I think all ages, they get really excited when they get one of these. But when you see the, the U4, four-year-olds and under, get one of these bad boys, you put it on their neck, 
Their chest puffs out bigger. They're walking around. They're just kind of like showing it off like this. Like, can you see it? Can you see it? You know? I'm not sure Ethan took his off before bed that night. Or uh, until bed that night. We couldn't let him sleep in it. In fact, we've had those conversations. You can't sleep in it. It's not wise. All right? It's not wise to sleep in it and something like this. What is it about this? Why is it that children, they love these? Why do Olympic athletes compete for these? Because when they're worn around their neck, it sets them apart. It sets them apart from the rest of humanity. When you become an Olympic athlete, you become set apart. When you win a medal, it sets you apart even more. Why do children love awards? They love awards because it sets them apart. They say, I am different. I've done something special. That's what wisdom looks like hanging around your neck. I am different. I've done something special for the Lord. I'm living my life to please him and not myself. I'm living my life to honor him and not others around me. I'm living my life to make my decisions in a way that will bring glory and honor to him and will lead to saving grace in my own life, not the destruction of sin. I have done something special. The question is, is this hanging around your neck? Not a soccer medal but wisdom. Wisdom's worldview. What is it you're doing? Are you like the world, spending countless hours trying to figure out how to do life right? Or are you trusting the one who thousands of years ago put it in written form for all people, for all time, to make the right choices in the right moment, in the right decisions to honor God? That is a decision only you and I can make in our own individual lives. Would you go to the Lord in prayer this morning with me? With every head bowed and every eye closed and nobody looking around, maybe you're here today, you don't know Jesus Christ is your Savior, would you go to him and just in faith believing say, Dear Jesus, I believe in you. As the eternal Son of the living God, I believe that you died on the cross and you rose from the dead for my sins. Come into my life and save me. Believing, friend, today, how are you making decisions in your life? How's your world view? How do you see life? Are your beliefs in the right place? Are your values, your priorities, your decisions you're making, are they, are they based on those beliefs and on that world view? Does your behavior shine like one who has wisdom around their neck? Talk to the Lord today. Ask Him to help you fine-tune wherever you need that strength today. Dear gracious and heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You for wisdom. Lord, may we hear wisdom. As You say, it's calling in the streets. May we recognize Your voice, the Holy Spirit. May we see through Your Word how to make the right decisions in our own lives. Lord, may we trust You with those decisions. And as we do, Lord, we look to you, the author and finisher of our faith, the author and finisher of all time. Lord, we trust you with those decisions. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand with us this morning as we respond to the Lord in song? i 
for just one second today. We want to introduce you, the, this is the Bush family, uh, Drew and Louise, you saw Louise uh, follow the Lord in Believer's Baptism this morning at New Life, and these are their children, Natalia, Desmond, and Beckett, and uh, they've, uh, Drew and Louise have trusted Christ as their Savior, both been baptized by immersion, they've been to our Next Steps classes, and uh, they have met with the leadership here, and they desire to make New Life their church home. And if you're in favor of that, would you raise your right hand? Just give us a big amen. Amen. And uh, Pastor Mike's going to take Drew and Louise to the lobby as we pray. And uh, when you leave, would you just extend them uh, either the right hand, high five, elbow, fist bump, or wave of fellowship. All right, however you feel comfortable during this time. But just welcome them to the family. I know Mark and Jackie will be out in the lobby too. Make sure you say goodbye to them as well on your way out the door. You can go with Pastor Mike at this time. And, uh, and everyone else, I'd encourage you, would you stand with us as we dismiss? I invite you to pray with me the benediction in front of you today. Now to the King eternal, immortal, invisible, to God alone who is wise, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be dismissed. 